Welcome to the Christ Community Church Sermon of the Week. We are so glad that you've tuned in. It is our prayer that as we preach the Bible, the Holy Spirit would speak to you and that your eyes would be fixed on Jesus. We hope you enjoy. Acts, Acts 2, 22 through 36. Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by death. For David says of him, I saw the Lord be ever before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope because you will not abandon me in, in Hades or allow your Holy One to see decay. <clears throat> you have revealed the paths of life to me you will fill me with gladness in your presence. Brothers and sisters, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not abandoned in Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. God has raised this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand and, until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house, all of the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning, Christ Community Church. How is everybody this morning? Good, good. If we've not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Joshua, and I get the honor and privilege of being the senior pastor here at Christ Community Church. And I'll tell you what, uh, I was excited yesterday, last night, you know, every Saturday night, I go to my office at home, and I spend time in prayer, and I spend time reviewing my sermon notes, and I was fired up for today. Was anyone else just fired up for church this morning? Um, and God's presence is here, and I believe that he's going to continue to be with us as we dive into the word today. But if you are new here, or <clears throat> maybe you've been coming for a little while and you've not quite yet got connected, we would love to know that you are here, and a great next step for you is to fill out a Connect card, and out on our Connection desk in the foyer, we have Connect cards available, and we just ask that after service, you take a moment, fill out that card, and turn it into our Connection team at the Connection desk, and they are going to give you a gift in return, and I will be out there as well, and would love to welcome you to Christ Community Church. But as we do every week, we want to celebrate uh, something, and I want to celebrate today that we had a great turnout at our kids' bowling event last Sunday. Um, the kids at our church came out and they had a great time building relationships and bowling um, and they just had a good time. I know that my kids talked about it all week, um, but I also want to celebrate all of the volunteers that showed up. Uh, you know, Sean and Courtney, are, they volunteer in our kid, to lead our kids' ministry, and they did a great job putting that together. And then all of our volunteers that came out, man, like, you guys just loved on the kids so well. I remember, uh, where's Jeremiah at? Jeremiah, where you at? Jeremiah over here. I remember a kid would, like, bowl a, and get a strike. And Jeremiah, it was Super Bowl Sunday, he was, like, celebrating like the kid had just won the Super Bowl. Like, it was awesome. Um, so we have a great... Uh, group of volunteers that serve in our kids' ministry. So let's give it up for them this morning. <clears throat> um, but yes, my voice is really raspy this morning, so please be praying for me. Um, 
it, the, that my wife is not here today. We have some kids at home. It uh, hit our household hard the last week and a half. So keep please lifting us up in prayer. As with many people in our church, I know we're dealing with sicknesses right now. So let's just actually, before we dive in, let's just pray for those in our church that are dealing with sickness. So Lord, we come to you today and God, we know that there's a bug going around and it's affecting many different people. And Lord, uh, we know that you still heal today. And God, we ask that you would bring healing to your people and God help those that are sick uh, recover from sickness, Lord, so that we can continue to move forward and do all that you have called us to do. And it's in Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the great Benjamin Franklin once said, in this world, nothing can be said, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. And we can definitely know those two things with certainty that because every time I buy something from the store and every time I receive a paycheck, I've got to pay my taxes and I'm not alone. Amen. Uh, But I personally think that there are more certainties in life. Um, I know with certainty that Pastor Norm and our worship team are going to lead us into God's presence every time we gather together through worship. I know with certainty that our elder John, who's actually was invited to preach at a church in our town this weekend, so make sure to uh, lift him up in prayer. But I know with certainty that our elder John on opening day of baseball is going to be watching his Boston Red Sox. I knew with certainty that they were going to pan the camera to say Taylor Swift a ridiculous number of times during the Super Bowl. (laughs) Something else, whenever we go spend time with family and friends and we're out late, we'll always get that one family member that will tell Madison and me like, hey, you're out late, but at least your kids are going to sleep in in the morning. I know with certainty with certainty that my oldest child, regardless of what time he goes to bed, is going to wake up at the same time. It does not matter what time he goes to bed. I know with certainty that any time of the day, if I go to my pantry and grab a bag of Boulder potato chips and open it up, and stick my hand in to get some chips. It does not matter if it's in the middle of the night and everyone's supposed to be asleep. It does not matter. I'm going to turn around with certainty and have at least one kid holding their hand up asking for chips. I know with certainty that if I'm driving south on US 41, that my sanctification is going to be tested with other drivers. I know also with certainty that on the opening day of deer season, I will be in a tree stand. And then lastly, I also know with certainty that pineapple does not belong on pizza and noodles do not belong in chili. So, (laughs) um, P.S., I am very excited for our chili cook-off tonight. But I kid, I kid, not all of these are absolute certainties, but life does have a lot of uncertainties. I've often heard the saying that uncertainty is the only certain thing in life. For example, we have no idea what's going to happen this year during the next political season. No idea what's going to happen. And this can be a a cause for a lot of anxiety for people. We don't always know what is going on with our health. There's people in here that are facing medical issues with complete uncertainty. Managers, anyone a manager in the business world today? Managers face the uncertainty of if their employees are even going to show up for work anymore. Uh, Parents face the constant uncertainty of wondering how their kids are going uh, going to turn out as adults. And there are many families in our community that face the uncertainty of not knowing where their next meal is going to come from. So many of us in this room are facing uncertainties of all types, whether it be relationships or finances or job situations. But what can we say is an absolute certainty? And there's one certainty we can know, and this is our big idea for today, that Christ rules as king of all, whether people like it or not. And we're in the middle of our verse-by-verse expedition through the book of Acts. And have you guys been enjoying the series so far? But... In this, in this book, we are seeing how the capital C Church of Jesus Christ began and, and how this book should show us that it's time to get 
after it and be a church in motion. And today we're diving into Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 36. And we just read through these verses just a few moments ago. But we're going to continue Peter's first sermon after the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost. And last week we talked about how we're not called to be fans on the sideline, that we're called to get in the game. And if you call yourself a Christian, you are called to be a participant in the king's mission. And in these verses today, we're going to learn a lot of things together. We'll see Peter move away from talking about the prophecy of Joel being fulfilled. We will see Peter now talk about the life and ministry of Jesus. And Peter will continue to center on the focal message of the Bible, the death and resurrection of the king. And we will learn that as we get after it, we can know with certainty, everyone say with certainty, that Christ is the ruler of all. So let's pray. Father, we just come to you this morning, and God, I pray that you would be with us as we dive into your word. God, we know that your Holy, the Holy Spirit, you were with us during worship, and we know that you're going to guide us into truth today as we go verse by verse through your word. And we just ask that you would speak to us, your people. And God, I pray that we as your people would receive this knowledge, that we would apply it to our lives. And God, that we would grow more and more into the image of Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week, in the first part of a sermon, we saw Peter quoting from the prophet Joel. And he was quoting from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And many people would think that it would be enough for Peter to stop after the quotation from Joel, considering all that we have in it. Like, like Peter, like, bro, like, you've already preached enough. You're like, you don't need any more scripture. You don't need anything else because you already told us of an outpouring <clears throat> of the Holy Spirit. You already told us about miraculous dreams and visions and prophecy. You already told us about signs and wonders regarding the day of the Lord, and you already gave us an invitation to call on the name of the Lord. So, Peter, you had an intro, you had attention, you had truth, application, inspiration, and a call to action. What more is there? But it wasn't enough <clears throat> because Peter had not yet spoken about the saving work of Jesus on our behalf. Everything, everything up until this point had been an introduction, explaining the strange things that they just saw. Now, Peter would bring the essential message. And we live in a world that love, we, we love to make everything about ourselves. Like, on social media, we, we, we think every, we can think that every social media post is about us. Like, we, we can read through the lines and make everything about us. And, and we can tend to do this with Scripture. We can take stories from the Bible and make them all about us. We like to think of ourselves as the center of the universe. And, and that can carry over into the way that we read Scripture. And it's important to know that the theme of the Bible, it, it, it's, it's not a principle. It's not a concept. It's not a set of values. It's not ethics to be learned. It's not just a book of spiritual sayings. It's not just a collection of doctrines or snapshots of God or a storehouse of propositions. Granted, all this stuff is in the Bible. And are there things that we learn from Scripture? Well, absolutely. Are there things that, uh, that, that, that apply to us from Scripture? Yes. After all, the gospel message is for us. God loves us. He cares about us and he has plans for us. But the focal message of the Bible is about a person to be known. And while there are many sub-themes in the Bible, like justice and peace and redemption, salvation or restoration, there's a grand theme that begins in Genesis and weaves its way through 66, the 66 books. The focal message of the Bible is the death and resurrection of the king. Everything in Scripture points to Jesus. Edmund Clowney once said, the Bible is the greatest storybook, not just because it is full of wonderful stories, but because it tells one great story, the story of Jesus. And a lot of our verses today are simply talking about who Jesus is. And it's, it, my, my prayer today is, you know, many of us 
have, have grown up in church and been in church for a long time. And when we can read scriptures like this about Jesus, it's very easy just to, to move forward because we've, we've heard it so many different times. But today, my prayer is that as we read through these verses about who Jesus is, that these truths would pierce our heart today. That, that we would just take moments throughout the sermon today and just rejoice in who Jesus is. So with that being said, let's reread verse 22. <clears throat> Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves no, so Peter said, listen to these words. Peter wanted people to pay attention. I wonder if I should start off my sermons like that. Like, listen to these words. That's what we see Peter doing here. And, and he's speaking as if he had something important to say. And remember last week, this Peter is empowered by the Holy Spirit and is a much different Peter than we saw in the Gospels. And he's bold. He has a message and he wants people to, to listen. And Peter continues in verse 22, and he said, This Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to you by God. <clears throat> so Peter here is now discussing the humanity of Jesus. He was fully God, and he was fully man. And he continued and said, With miracles and wonders and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. So Peter's audience here knew that Jesus was a real person from the town of Nazareth. Peter also explained at the end of the verse that this crowd knew that Jesus had performed many signs and miracles. And Peter here is like, look, guys, you know that Jesus did all of this. You also know that God's hand is on Jesus's life. They heard him speak. They watched his life and they even watched him raise the dead, and through all these miracles, through all these signs, through all these wonders, Jesus showed everyone what his second coming and his kingdom would be like. There will be no illness. There will be no demon possession. There will be no fear of storms. There will, there will be no death because King Jesus will reverse the curse and all things will be restored. And let's reread verse 23. <clears throat> Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan. Everyone say determined plan. And foreknowledge. Everyone say foreknowledge. You used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. So this is an extremely important uh, scripture in the Bible. And there's a lot to unpack here. So Peter in this verse is now describing the death of Christ from both a human and divine perspective. So Peter is emphasizing the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. And notice how Peter said he was delivered up to God's determined plan and foreknowledge. And this is what we have to know. The death of Christ was part of God's foreordained plan. Meaning, he planned it in advance. Um, many of us make plans in life, but how many of you guys know that plans don't always uh, go according to the plan, right? Um, I remember when we moved to Florida from Alabama and we had to drive about nine hours. And I'm telling you, I had the entire trip planned out. I felt like I was the dad of the year for how good of a plan that I had put together, okay? And it started by making sure that a, I got a U-Haul that, was, that wasn't too big. Um, uh, let me just say this, okay? I, I'm in, I pastor in Brazil now, and I'm, I'm a different man than the child that I grew up as, okay? I, like many people in here, I didn't grow up on a farm, okay? Like, my dad never had a truck. He has a truck now. My first car was a Toyota Corolla. I grew up in a concrete jungle, okay? Like, I grew up in the inner city playing basketball all the time. Like, I was not a country kid, like a country boy growing up, okay? That was not me. So I never had exposure to driving big vehicles and trailers, 
Okay, so when I got married, I married a girl that grew up with all of that, with horse trailers and large trucks, and I had to learn all of that. But when I, when, but when I got married, I didn't know how to do all this. So I didn't feel comfortable driving a very big U-Haul with a trailer, because in my opinion, that's like driving a semi without a CDL, okay? And I, I went and I reserved the right size U-Haul, because not only did I not want to drive a big U-Haul, I also... Uh, we had to downsize because we were moving into an apartment. And I had that part planned out. I had the right size U-Haul reserved. I would be able to still drive my truck and be comfortable, uh, you know, or, uh, haul my truck and be comfortable, tow my truck and be, dear Lord, not haul, tow my truck and be comfortable. And I had it all planned out. But lo and behold, I get to U-Haul and they said, we're sorry, the only U-Haul we have is the largest one. It's like, that's great. That's great. So I grabbed the U, I drove the U-Haul to the house and Madison was like, why is that the U-Haul we have? I said, don't ask me, ask U-Haul. And we got the, we got everything loaded, put the truck on. And next part of the plan, I picked out for a city. I picked out a city for us to stop at. And we had little kids. So we, we had to leave that at the, e in the evening. So we drove about halfway and then we stopped in the panhandle in Florida. And um, I thought that I had picked out a great hotel to stay at. I made our reservation in advance and we get there and we check in and I'm walking to the hotel room feeling like a champ because I took care of all this. And we walk in and I am not a bougie person by any means, okay? I promise that. I'm very simple. But this was by far the nastiest hotel that I've ever stayed at. It had all the gunk, grease, grime, and all in between. It was disgusting. Like Madison was like, I can't even sleep right now because I feel like there's just going to be bugs crawling all over. Like it was, it was awful, okay? So part one of my plan was a failure. Part two of my plan was a failure. Then the final part of the plan, okay? I wanted to be a cool dad and for the last half of my drive, let my oldest son sit in the front of the U-Haul with me in his car seat. So I put him in there and we get to going. And um, I also had planned out that what I was going to do was in Florida, when we got to where we're going, I was going to stop at the U-Haul spot, take off my truck trailer, and then go to the apartment to unload so that when I came back, I could drop the U-Haul off and then easily take my truck. So I was going to turn into the U-Haul spot. Well, we get to the city that we were moving in, and uh, by this point, my kid is screaming that he needed to use the restroom. And when I say screaming, he was screaming his head off. So I'm stressed out because the roads in this town are super small and I'm driving this gigantic beast and my kid is screaming his head off and I'm stressed out and I'm trying to make sure that I don't miss my turn into the U-Haul spot. But bam, what do you know? I miss my turn and there's no large parking lots anywhere to turn the U-Haul around. All it is is small little like, like there's nothing. There's nowhere for me to turn around. And I'm not like, I wasn't like many of the country boys in here today. I couldn't turn it around by my like I couldn't do it, okay? I didn't know what I was doing. And then I find a plaza. And I'm like, okay, I can go to the back and I can drive around. So there's these buildings and it looked like I could go around the back and then drive all the way around. And, and I'm already stressed out, my kid's screaming, and then next, what do you know, my wife is calling me, saying, what on earth are you doing? And I politely told her, Madison, I missed my, my turn, Isaiah is screaming his head off, I'm trying to get back, I'm trying to figure it out. So I turn into the plaza, and I go behind the buildings, and when I get to the end, I realize that the only way to get through is through a bank drive through Okay? that has an awning with a clearance. The U-Haul's way too big to get through that. So I'm in the back of this building, nowhere to go. I can't go over here because it's like a swamp that you can't drive through over the curb. I had nowhere to go. I have about 20 cars behind me, honking at me, cussing me out, wondering what on earth is this idiot doing back here? And I'm like, I don't know what to do. And then my wife's calling me again, and then my kid's still screaming. And so I start trying to back up to get out, and then bam, I backed the, the back of my truck into a tree and then in my tailgate. This is a top three embarrassing moment of my life. And I eventually, I eventually got out, but my perfect plan had utterly failed. And 
My wife and I both say to this day that this whole little incident when we first moved to this town was just a snapshot of what the next six, six months of our life was going to be like, and that was true. So we may have plans, and plans will often fail, but this isn't the case for God. God is sovereign, and what he plans will come to pass. Now, in the second part of this verse, after Peter said that Christ's crucifixion was a part of God's foreordained plan, Peter said, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. And this shows us something that is also true when it comes to God's plans. When God brings his will to pass, he works in, through, and by the real decisions of real people. And Peter did not flinch in saying this. His first concern was not to please his audience, but to tell them the truth. The, the spirit-filled Peter did this. Peter reminded his audience that they were responsible for Christ's crucifixion. And here's the thing. So are we. And Jesus' death occurred as a result of the plan and foreknowledge of God, but it was the free and sinful acts of human beings that executed that plan. So the men of Israel meant to destroy Jesus, but in the process, they were working out nothing less than the, than the eternal will of God. And at the end of the sermon, I want to spend just a few moments talking about some practical steps of how we can balance God's sovereignty existing alongside our free, responsible choices. And before we get there, these next 10 or so verses like I said, are all about Jesus. So as Peter said, pay attention as we journey through these verses. So let's reread verse 24. God raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by death. So Peter knew that Jesus could not remain, or that, that, that Jesus could not remain bound by death, as we will see Peter dive into the coming verses. It was not possible that Jesus should remain a victim of the sin and hatred of man. He would triumph over it. And notice how this verse says, ending the pains of death. The word translated pains here means birth pangs. So it's suggesting that the tomb was a womb out of which Jesus was born in resurrection glory. And this verse also said, it was not possible for him to be held by death. It was impossible for death to hold Jesus down. Ain't no grave going to hold down the body of Jesus. Guys, death could not hold him. And it's easy to hear this and to just move on because we've heard it so many times. But let's just, come on, let's just take a moment. Let's just rejoice to the Lord this morning that death is defeated. Come on, let's give God praise. Jesus, you defeated the grave. Jesus, death is defeated. It's powerful. Death was defeated. And because Jesus defeated death, guess who also defeats death? Those that put faith in him. So Jesus, we give you praise this morning that it was impossible for death to hold you down. Let's reread verse 25. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. So last week we saw Peter quoting Joel. And now we see Peter quoting David. Peter in this verse is quoting Psalm 16 verses 8 through 11. And in Psalm 16, David is primarily speaking about his own human experience and suffering. But in the verses that Peter is quoting... He, being David, is ultimately talking about Jesus. So Peter is quoting David here, and David said, I saw the Lord ever before me. So this speaks of a decision that David made to put God first in his life. And he determined that God would always be his focus. And because of what we see David finish this verse with saying, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. So this was the plain result of David's decision to put God first. And there was a security in David's life that would not have otherwise existed. And th this is the case for us. The future is your friend when Jesus is your Lord. 
despite uncertainties in our lives, we don't have to fear when we are serving God. When, when, when we declare Christ is Lord, we have the certainty that we don't have to worry about the future. Why? Because God is in control. But Peter recognized that this verse from David was ultimately talking about Jesus. And in the ultimate sense, only Jesus did this perfectly. He was always in the intimate presence of the Father. And Peter is showing how despite people wanting to crucify Jesus, Jesus would not be shaken. He would be secure. So let's reread verse 26. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope. So David continued to describe the benefits of his decision to put God first. And this decision brought a gladness to David's life. Notice how he said, my heart is glad. He also said, my tongue rejoices. But again, we also see Peter recognize that these verses were ultimately telling of Jesus. Let's go to verse 27. Because you will not abandon me in Hades or allow your Holy One to see decay. David was speaking beyond himself. This verse says, what it says right here, your Holy One. In one sense, David was the Holy One of God, where, who, whose soul would not be left in the grave. Yet in a greater and more literal sense, Peter recognized that only Jesus Christ fulfills this in his resurrection. And Peter is pleading his case for Christ in front of the crowd. And in these ways, as Peter understood, the resurrection proves the perfection of Jesus' work on the cross. Let's reread verse 28. You have revealed the paths of life to me. You will fill me with gladness in your presence. So with these words, David seemed to understand that the benefits of this life from being committed to God were received in both this life and the life beyond. So the quote-unquote path of life that, that is mentioned here is something enjoyed by the believer both now and in eternity. God gives us eternal life to enjoy as a present gift extending into eternity. And, and this is another one of those things that we can read through and we can just skim over. But no, like I want us to take a moment again and let's rejoice that we have eternal life with God. Come on, let's give God praise this morning that through the work of Jesus, when we declare that Christ is Lord, we have eternity promised with the Lord. Forever. We don't have to worry about tomorrow because we know who holds tomorrow and we know that we have the promise of eternity with the Lord. So God, we give you praise for that this morning. <clears throat> but again, Peter recognized that Psalm 16 was ultimately about Jesus Christ. And Peter is explaining to the crowd that instead of being punished for his glorious work on the cross, Jesus was rewarded as prophetically described in this psalm. Let's reread verse 29. Brothers and sisters, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. So imagine going up to a Muslim and telling them, hey bro, Muhammad is dead and buried. Or imagine going up to a Buddhist and telling them, hey, bud, uh, Buddha died and he stayed dead. It, it, it may not go over very well if we do that, but this is the point that Peter is making in verse 29. He said about David, he is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Peter is explaining that David died and is still dead and his, as his tomb will attest. Now, his soul was with the Lord, but his physical body was still dead and buried. And Peter is pointing out that Psalm 16 cannot be speaking about its human author, David, because he was dead and remained buried. The psalm had to have been prophetically speaking of the Messiah, Jesus. Let's reread verse 30. Since he, he being David, was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on his throne. And 
What uh, Peter here is, he, he, he's calling David a prophet because David confidently predicted that God would fulfill his promise that one of his descendants would rise from the dead and rule forever. God told David this in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 13. When your time comes and you rest with your, your being David, when, when David rests with his ancestors, I will raise up after you your descendant who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He, this is prophetic of towards Jesus, so he being Jesus here, is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And what Peter is doing here is explaining to the crowd that Jesus with certainty was the promised Messiah. And let's reread verse 31. Seeing what was to come, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah. He was not abandoned in Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. And what Peter is doing here is, is what we've been discussing. He's explaining that the words of David described much more than just David's experience. Let's reread verse 32. God raised this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. So Peter quoted Psalm 16 and explained that this psalm was a prophecy of Jesus. And now Peter is saying that God raised Jesus from the dead and that Jesus ascended back to heaven. And he is expressing that this group of people were all witnesses of this. And, and I've said, uh, said this quite a bit during the series, much of the Christian gospel relies on eyewitness accounts. Let's reread verse 33. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God, and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. So, when this verse says he has been exalted to the right hand of God, Peter is talking about the ascension, and when he said he has poured out what you both see and hear, he is referring to Pentecost. So, he is saying that to this crowd, which was the group of people that we talked about a few weeks ago that were drawn to the sound of people speaking in tongues. He's now preaching to that crowd, explaining what they saw, right? And, and he is telling them what they saw and heard on Pentecost. The 120 people speaking in tongues was a direct result of Jesus sending the Holy Spirit. And let's reread verse 34 through 35. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. So now what we're seeing here is Peter, Peter once again quoting David, and this time he's quoting from Psalms 110 verse 1. And this verse of the Old Testament is quoted in the New Testament more than any other verse. It's quoted or referred to at least 25 times. And the point of this psalm is that Jesus, not David, is the one seated at the right hand of God, a position of unique honor and authority. Peter used this to show that the Messiah was the focus of Psalm 110 and that, it was, that this Messiah was in fact divine, that he is God. And now, now, so we've made it through these verses, uh, we get to the high point of Peter's sermon, the moment we've been waiting for, okay? We get to where we pulled our big idea from today. Let's reread verse 36. <clears throat> Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty, everyone say with certainty, that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And what was our big idea today? That we can know with certainty that Christ rules as king of all, whether people like it or not. And this declaration of Peter during this time was a powerful statement. Because during the first century, the cult of emperor worship spread throughout the entirety of the Roman Empire. And the most powerful, perhaps, of the Caesars who reigned during that first century was Octavian. And he took upon himself the title of Caesar Augustus. And Octavian, he was a powerful ruler, and he was worthy of the titles that befit kings and emperors. Indeed, he was, he was mighty and he was authoritative. But one thing he was not is he did not have Augustness. You see, Augustness is an attribute that belongs to God alone, 
for it denotes his transcendent majesty and eternal glory. And during the first and second centuries, citizens of Rome were required to take a loyalty oath and say publicly, Caesar Curios, which means Caesar is Lord. And the Christian community, however, would not say it. They were willing, as civil servants of Rome, to offer the emperor honor and obedience, but they would not take a loyalty oath, even if that refusal cost them their lives, because their confession was Jesus is Lord. And the first creed of the first century church was short and simple. It was Jesus ho curios, meaning Jesus is Lord. And this is what we're seeing here in verse 36. The, 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 the big part of Peter's sermon here is Peter is here, Peter is saying that you can know with certainty that Christ is Lord. Jesus has been placed in the seat of cosmic authority. God has elevated Christ to his right hand and given him all authority on heaven and earth. And we can know with certainty that Christ is above every emperor. He is above every governor. He is above every king. And he is above every president. We can know with certainty that God has placed Jesus at his right hand, calling him not just king, but king of kings, calling him not just Lord, but Lord of lords. And we can know with certainty that Christ reigns above all, above all rulers, above all sickness, above all darkness, above all things, Christ is ruler of all. And there will be people that try to deny this. There will be people that try to oppose this. There will be rulers that mandate things that are contrary to the ways of Jesus. But we can know with certainty that there will be a day where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord. And Peter is telling us, go ahead, go ahead. <clears throat> Peter is telling us that with certainty, Jesus is above all. With certainty, Jesus is ruler of all things. And with certainty, God's plan will come to pass, regardless of if people like it or not. And people can be hostile to his reign. People can fight against his rulership. People can try to reduce him to something else than Lord. People can oppose him. Nations can stand against him. Earthly rulers can try to take his place. It does not matter. Christ is Lord of all, and we should continue to submit to his rule and trust him all of our days, no matter the cost, no matter the cost. The early church was willing to die for this message. And my question to us is, are we? Are we willing to submit to the Lordship of Christ and declare that he is Lord no matter the cost? With certainty, Christ is Lord. So we've made it through Acts 2, 22 through 36. And as we said at the beginning, there are many uncertainties in life. We don't know how our kids are going to turn out. We don't know if World War III will start this year. We don't know what this political season is going to look like. We don't know what tomorrow holds. But with certainty, we can know who holds tomorrow. With certainty, we can know that God is sovereign. He has a plan, and it will come to pass. And we must always hold on to this truth as we continue to get after it and to be a church in motion. And just for a moment, as I promised, I want to just share some practical things on how we can balance God's sovereignty existing alongside our free, responsible choices. So balancing the sovereignty of God alongside our choices is, we, I, I talk about a few of these topics, is a really hot topic amongst theologians. And there are many different viewpoints, and I've got four of them to show you guys today. Uh, number one is, they call it determinism. So this is the view that God determines every event that occurs in the history 
of the world. And then there is fatalism, which is the belief that what will be, will be. In other words, we have no control over our actions, our fate, or our future. And then there is the belief of free will, the belief that people have the capacity to make decisions independently of God or any other external influence. And then, fourth, we have compatibilism. Compatibilism. The belief that God's predetermination and meticulous providence is compatible with voluntary choice being free will. So now, like I said, this is a hot topic of debate, but as I've done this for a few weeks, I, as your pastor, according to my studies, according to my research, and according to my experience, believe that the most biblical choice is compatibilism. I consider myself a compatibilist. If you disagree with me, that is fine, but let's talk about this, okay? So like we saw today in our verses, Christ's death on the cross was carried out by what? The predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. So this is what Scripture says, okay? There's no escaping this. And although God had determined that Christ should die, those responsible for his death were still held accountable for their actions. Christ was put to death by wicked men, but Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, said this in Isaiah 53.10, yet, so he was put to death by wicked men, yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. So once again, the, the answer to the question is, who put Jesus to death? It was both God and the wicked people, two purposes carried out by two entities within a single action. And we see this in many different parts of Scripture as well. We have the story of Joseph and his brothers in Genesis 37. And Joseph was hated by his brothers because their father Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other sons and because of Joseph's dreams and their interpretation. Now, as many of us know, at an opportune time, Joseph's brothers sold him as a slave to traveling Midianite traders. And then they dipped his tunic in blood and... Um, of a slain goat in order to deceive their father into thinking that Joseph had been mauled by a beast. And after many years, like we all know, during which Joseph had been blessed by the Lord, Joseph's brothers meet him in Egypt. And Joseph reveals himself to them. And it is Joseph's discussion with his brothers that is the most pertinent to the issue. Genesis 45, 8 says, Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. So what makes this statement startling is that Joseph had previously said that his brothers had, in fact, sold him into Egypt. We saw that in Genesis 45, verses 4 through 5. And a few chapters later, the concept of compatibilism is presented. In Genesis 50, 20, it says, you planned evil against me. God planned it for good to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. The Genesis story tells us that it was, in fact, the brothers who sold Joseph into Egypt. However, Joseph makes it clear that God had done so. And those who reject the the concept of compatibilism would say that this verse is simply stating that God, quote unquote, used Joseph's brother's actions for good. However, That's not what the text says. From Genesis 45 through 50, we are told that one, Joseph's brothers had sent Joseph to Egypt. Two, God had sent Joseph to Egypt. Three, Joseph's brothers had evil intentions in sending Joseph to Egypt. And four, God had good intentions in sending Joseph to Egypt. So the question is, who on earth sent Joseph to Egypt? And the bewildering answer is that both Joseph's brothers and God did. And it was one action being carried out by two entities, the brother and God doing it simultaneously. So what should we do to balance God's sovereignty existing alongside our choices that we are responsible for? One is know that God is sovereign over all things. Sovereignty is defined as the one who exercises power without limitation. Psalms 115 verse 3 says, Our God is in heaven and does what? Whatever he pleases. 
And Charles Spurgeon once said, when you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you lay your head. When you don't have the answers, trust in God's sovereignty. When you don't know what to do, trust in God's sovereignty. When all hell is breaking loose in our world, trust in God's sovereignty. I love these lyrics from a band called Ghost Ship and their song called Beyond. It's talking about the Lord. It says, you are over it all. You cover it all. If you feel it all, I think you can heal it all. If you made it all, you can change it all. And if you made it all, I know you can save it all. So trust in God's sovereignty. Number two, know that God knows all things. 1 John 3, 19-20 says, This is how we will know that we belong to the truth and will reassure our hearts before Him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and He knows all things. Number three, know that man is held accountable for what he does. Jude one through Jude uh, chapter one verse fifteen says, "It's talking about the Lord to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly concerning all the ungodly acts that they have done in an ungodly way, and concerning all the harsh things ungodly sinners have said against Him." God will execute judgment to hold people accountable for their actions. But thank God for salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And lastly, number four, trust in the Lord and do not lean on your own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5-6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. In all your ways know Him and He will make your path straight. And you have Calvinists and you have Arminians, you have people in between, and regardless of where you stand, this is, this is, what, this is what we have to come with peace, peace with, okay? Is that the Bible often affirms the reality of both divine sovereignty and genuine human choice without fully explaining how the two can possibly work together without conflict. And we have to be okay with not having all the answers but choosing to trust in the Lord regardless. We don't have all the answers to all theology and and all of these things. We don't know how God works completely. We don't know all of His ways. But we we have to live out these four things right here. We have to know that God is sovereign over all things. We have to know that God knows all things. We have to know that we will be held accountable for what we do, thank God that we're saved through Jesus and that we are forgiven, amen? And we have to trust in the Lord and not lean on our own understanding. So Christ Community Church, let's remind ourselves one more time. With certainty, we can know that Christ is ruler of all, whether people like it or not. So let's do this, okay? Like we learned today, let's continue to submit to God as we get after it. And this is the question for us as we leave today. Where do I need to be more submissive to God? What area of my life have I not fully submitted, submitted to God? Is it the way I spend my time? Is it, is it my finances? Is it who I surround myself with? Is it the entertainment that I watch? Is it the music that I listen to? Where have I not fully submitted to God? And maybe you're in here and you've never fully, you've never submitted to God at all. And remember, Christ is Lord, whether you like it or not. And I implore you today to declare that Christ is Lord. He's Lord regardless of if you declare him as Lord or not. So I invite you today, declare him as Lord and receive the free gift of salvation. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you would be saved. And if you'd like to declare that Christ is Lord, We invite you up to prayer at the end of service here in just a moment with our prayer team or come see me after service, one of our elders. We would love to pray with you. Now today, we saw Peter continue to preach his sermon. Next week, we get to see the response of his listeners. So if you guys would stand to your feet, let's close out in prayer.
Lord, I pray that as we continue to be a church that gets after it, Lord, that we would be a church that submits to God. God, I pray that amidst all the uncertainties in our life, Lord, that we would continue to trust in your sovereign plan, Lord. God, that even though our plans will fail, like my travel plan to Florida did, Lord, I pray that we would know that your plans will always come to pass, Father. And we give you praise for that today. And God, I pray that we would know that we will be held accountable for our actions. So Holy Spirit, help us to make the right choices as individuals. And God, as a church, as we move forward into what you have for us, Lord, help us to make wise decisions, Lord, that bring you glory. And God, I pray that we would not lean on our own understanding and that with certainty, we would continue to submit and to trust in the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go to the Lord and worship. Well, that wraps up our sermon this week. We hope that you enjoyed. If you're in need of prayer, you can email me at pastor at christcommunitychurch.org. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook, and follow us on Instagram at mycccbrazil. We pray that you have a great week.